Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Straight From The Heart. And I am Pastor Tanya Knight, or Lady T. Knight, however you know me. Um, I'm glad to be here with you this evening. I titled this, or the topic is Being an Educator. And the reason why I am doing this topic is because once again, um, I do receive messages, I do receive questions, and most of the questions, most of the comments, most of the messages that I've received have been about being an educator, whether that's a teacher, whether that's a para, whether that's a teaching assistant. Um, I had two um, administrators make comments, so I just wanted to just title this being an educator. And the other thing that sparked this is that I was just reminiscing on the journey that I've been on in education. For me, it began um, for, I think, most parents at least, with our own children. So it began with me, with my, we're with our two oldest specifically, just trying to find a place that I felt was a safe place for them to be. We as parents are our children's first educators, are their first teachers. And specifically our oldest, our daughter, because she was our first, um, very, very particular on whose hands I would put her into uh, when I was not present. And the other thing that kind of sparked this besides the questions and besides the comments um, and the messages is that a couple of years ago, I received a message via Facebook Messenger and it was someone who was looking for a former teacher. And it started out, are you the same um, person that used to teach at such and such a school? And I'm looking at the picture and I'm saying to myself, the face looks really, really familiar. And as I continue to read, the person gave me their name and I was like, oh my goodness. My very first class, the very first teaching assignment that I had was a fifth grade class and there were 32 students in the class and once again my first year teaching there was no para or teaching assistant um, or what they call a um, supply teacher here no and they assigned me a mentor who came, I think it was every other week, and then came once a month, and then every other month, and then I was on my own. She was a wealth of knowledge and a wealth of information, and I learned a great deal from her. However, being a first-time teacher with a classroom filled with students who range in abilities and um, challenges was challenging. However, as I looked at the face of this young person who sent me a message, I was like, okay, I know this person. <laughs> and when I said, yes, it's me, and I typed out his name and I said, it's so good to see you. Wow, you're an adult now. What's going on? How's mom? How's sis? And I remember that being a first year teacher, you know, people's advice to me was don't smile until Christmas, right? And, and show them who's boss and this, that, and the other. And what I went with instead was believing God for wisdom in the classroom and believing God that because he chose me to be in this profession and he knew my personality, he knew how he created me, that it would be best for me to be me. 
and you know not without making some some mistakes and some missteps but at that point I said I can't be anyone else I know how to be me so I can't be anybody else and the young man told me I'm so glad that it's you because I just wanted to tell you I'm a teacher today because of you and his elementary school teacher and I, you know, we corresponded for a minute and he just said, you know, I'm not asking you to friend me on Facebook. I just wanted to reach out when I saw the face and I saw the name. I just needed to know that this was the same person. I just wanted to tell you, thank you. And as an educator, walking into, specifically as a teacher, walking into a classroom with students, once again, varying abilities, to be quite transparent, the last thing that was on my mind was making making an impact where someone would come back and tell me thank you. That wasn't the reason for me, I would say, answering the call to be a teacher. The reason for me answering the call to be a teacher was that I knew that I was called. I knew that it was something that God had placed on the inside of me. I also knew that just teaching was it wasn't it that wasn't going to be the end game there was much more but the fact that one was inspired to be an educator because of something that I said because of something that I did because of me just being who and how God created me was the cherry on top of everything else. So being an educator means to me, first of all, being, being a lifelong learner, knowing that this is who or how um, God created you. You're, you're stepping into not just a job, but a profession, not just a profession, but a confession. This is, this is why God created me. He created me to make a difference in some way in the lives of not just the children in the classroom, but I believe that it's even broader than that. Take it a step up or a step further to even be an inspiration to other educators. Being an educator is not light work, it's not easy work, it is work. And I have to say that even in the hardest of times, it's work that I enjoy. I enjoy maybe not so much the process, but the process is necessary. And in going through the process, I understand that there is an outcome. So having the outcome in mind helps us go through the process. 2020, people keep saying has been, and it is, um, a unprecedented year. However, as an educator, no matter what is given to us, no matter what comes our way, no matter what is thrown at us, no matter what we're faced with, have you ever noticed that we always seem to make it work? Um, I never Zoomed before. I never heard of Zoom before. Google Classroom was not a thing that I was interested in and the other platforms that have been presented but yet what did we do we're like MacGyver you know we take what is handed to us and we make it work I would be um, remiss not to mention that for me being a Christian woman, 
who's an educator. I'm a Christian first. And honestly, without the wisdom of God, without the peace of God. Now, there are some days, especially during this time, where all around me is not necessarily peaceful. There are some days, there have been some weeks that things have been in turmoil. Um, there have been some days where I've been so tired, sometimes I can't see straight. However, my source of my strength, the source of my peace um, is not in what I do. Um, it's in who and whose I am. So what does this got to do with anything, Pastor Tanya? Why are you on here talking about, you know, being an educator when maybe some people who are watching are not educators? I believe that I'm talking about this because sometimes we try to fix things that we see that need to be fixed with natural or by natural means. There's a lot broke. There's a lot that's broken. There's a lot that needs to be fixed. And I'm not saying that doing natural things do not yield benefits and do not bring about change, but lasting change will come by prayer. I would much rather pray get clear direction and follow those directions because let me let you in on something. None of this has caught God by surprise. That's something that um, our pastor, you know, in the Bronx has said often, and I will never forget it. When we were moving here, that was something that she wrote in a card to me. And it's something that has become um, a staple for me that nothing catches God by surprise. He knew that these events were going to take place. And because he knew that these events were going to take place, he has a plan. Now, we can have our plans, but the Bible says that many are the plans in a man's heart, but it is God's purpose that will prevail. So I want to know what his plan is. I want to know what his purpose is. And through prayer, and by prayer, I don't mean just talking to God and then just getting up and moving on. But the communication, the, 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 the art of prayer, we'll find and we'll discover his plan will be revealed. So as an educator, um, whether you're a parent educating your children because you are your child's first teacher, whether you're a mentor um, whether you're, whatever capacity you're in, you teach someone. You teach someone. You don't have to be in a brick and mortar building. We found that out, right? Because we do things, we've been doing things or have done things remotely. You're teaching someone. Someone is gleaning from your wisdom. Someone, you have influence over someone, right? And what I've come to realize is that I have to tap into what God's plan is for the situation. I have to follow the wisdom of God in order for the results to be lasting results. It's God's plan that I desire to see fulfilled. It's his purpose that I desire to see fulfilled. And as an educator, as a Christian, woman who's an educator my foundation and my first line of defense should always be father i need your wisdom i'm very fortunate blessed to um, have taught several different grades i started out as a fifth grade teacher then got demoted right <laughs> went i'm joking um, became a, a kindergarten teacher. And then from kindergarten, I went to fourth grade. From fourth grade, I went to third grade. Um, I've taught first grade, I've taught second grade, and went, went back to third grade. And 
I felt a pull in another direction. So now I am teaching middle school and high school. And I'm very fortunate to be teaching at a Christian school. And I say fortunate because before each class, I pray. And what I pray is, you know, God give me wisdom. You know, I pray over my students. God give me wisdom because that's what I need. That's what we need. We need wisdom. We need wisdom to carry out the plans and the purposes that God has for us. So in this season and in this time, uh, I want to encourage you to pray for teachers, pray for educators, pray for administrators, pray for anyone who's in the specific field of education because it's not easy. It's difficult. Um, but I believe that this can be our finest hour as born again believers. It is, I'm of the frame of mind that we shouldn't be sitting on the sidelines. There's no reason for us to be sitting on the sidelines. We should be front and center. We should be the ones that possess the answers to problems. We should be the ones that people come to and ask, you know, listen, I'm, 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 at, a, I'm at a loss. I need to know how to do this. This is the time and this is the moment and this is the hour. Someone once said to me that the, the lockdown during the pandemic um, should have been considered preparation time. I believe that God has been speaking to us, not just during this lockdown, not just during COVID, but he has been speaking to us for quite some time, right? Um, we, we, this hour really should not have caught us off guard. It may have caught us a little bit by surprise, but it should never have caught us off guard. So we have answers. Dare I say that we are the answers to some people's prayer. We possess on the inside of us the answers, the solutions that are needed in this time and in this hour. I was um, teaching a lesson to um, my students and something really, really struck me about this particular lesson. It was talking about them having all things in common. None suffered lack and they had all things in common. That's what the church is supposed to be. We're supposed to um, be on one accord. How will they know that we are Christians? A lot, a lot of people like to say by our love, but not just by our love, but by our love one for another. Can we have differences, differences of opinion? Absolutely. We are going to have differences of opinion. However, that's how the world will know that we are Christians, by our love one for another, that we come together and, you know, none suffers lack, right? We, we are in one accord. That's what the world needs to see. They need to see that we're in one accord. The only way I believe that we will get there is if we... Um, practice the art of prayer, that if we go to God in prayer, um, we were talking about walking in love and why that's important with my class today as well. Why is it important to walk in love? Well, it's important to walk in love because the Bible even says that the commandments are summed up in this, right? That you love the Lord your God, your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength, and your neighbor as yourself, right? The commandment of love, um, I know one preacher put it this way, divine love has never been to divorce court. When you have people who are willing to walk in love, who are willing to walk in forgiveness, um, this is not the way I thought this was going to go, but we're going to go this way anyway. When you are willing to prefer others over yourself, when you're willing to, as Paul talked about in the book of Philemon, don't charge it to, to them, you know? Don't, don't, don't blame them. If anything, you know, 
put it to my charge. When you look at that person, look at that person as if it's me. You and I are connected, so look at that person as if you were me. And what did he do who is acting as Christ, right? Christ um, took our place, right? He was sinless. He did no wrong, but he took our place. And if we started looking at each other through the eyes of Jesus, if we started to um, consider our brothers and sisters as a part of the body, no man who loves himself treats his body just any sort of a way. And I think um, as a Christian woman who is an educator, that's my first go-to. It's not always easy, especially when you're faced with um, challenges at the workplace, when you see things that could be done differently, or you know you see injustices, and I'm talking about in education. It's more beneficial for me to pray, and I'm not saying pray and do nothing, that's not what I'm saying, to pray, get the plan and purpose of God for me. What, what, what am I supposed to do? What can I do to make this better? And then walk that out. Then walk that out. Because to me, it's guaranteed that the results that are necessary to affect change will happen. I have to walk in love. I don't have to, you know, we can, we can disagree, but I don't have to be disagreeable. I have to walk in love. I have to forgive because if I want my prayers answered, if I don't want anything to hinder my prayers, um, not just for me and my family, but the prayers that I have for, you know, what God lays on my heart, prayer for government, uh, my prayers for those who are in authority. If I don't want my prayers hindered, it's a must that I walk in love. So putting in the context of being an educator, um, as an educator, as a Christian woman who is an educator, I am obligated to walk the way Jesus walked. How is that possible? Well, he was our example. He was our example. The Bible tells me that I'm not to be conformed to this world. I'm not to act like the world acts. I'm not to, to, to my words are not supposed to be you know, along the lines of, of how the world is, is speaking and acting and doing. I'm supposed to be transformed. And how am I transformed? I'm transformed by the renewing of my mind. How do I renew my mind? I renew my mind by reading the word of God. I renew my mind by muttering, by um, speaking the word of God. I renew my mind by being in fellowship in communion with God. That's how I renew my mind. So as a Christian woman who is an educator, um, my, my classroom should be a safe haven for my students. And it's a safe haven for my students, not just on a temporary short-term fix. But my desire is that what they receive from me not necessarily just from the textbooks, not necessarily just from the lesson, but what I impart to them, and I believe that they receive impartation, will not just carry them through the school day, but will carry them even when they're um, you know, away from that atmosphere. Because we do have students who um, deal with some adverse situations, yeah, even here. So if I can leave you with anything, if I could leave you with anything, as a born again believer, remember that you may not be a teacher, right? Having that title. You may not be an administrator having that title, but you're teaching someone. Someone is gleaning from you and someone is learning from you. What lessons do you want to teach? Um, what legacy do you want to leave? Because that's what we're doing. That's what we're doing. So as a Christian woman who is an educator, first and foremost, my foundation is the word of God because I don't want just a temporary fix. We have gaping wounds and band-aids just won't do. We have to pour in the oil and the wine. We have to believe for restoration. We have to believe for healing. We have to believe for miracles. 
because we're living in a day and an age where, yeah, I believe the enemy is coming after our children, but he can't have them. I'm not moved by what I see. I'm not moved by how I feel. I'm not moved by the chatter that's going on in the world today. The only thing that moves me is what the word of God says. And I have to stand on the foundation of not just who he is, but who I am in him. So educators, not just teachers, not just administrators, but those of us, which can be all of us, who have the, the obligation to pass on what we know to another generation, I implore you, don't be conformed to this world. Don't be conformed. Do not be so readily fit into the mold of this world. Because this world will have you going here, there, and everywhere. This world will tell you that it will never get better. This world will, will sell you quick fixes. Try this. Try this. This will work. This will work. Um, the only constant, the only thing that has been proven to eradicate disease is the word of God. So um, that's what I just wanted to leave with you this evening. I'm so glad that I have the privilege of uh, Facebook Live. I'm grateful. I am grateful. It, it's a blessing, you know, when we use it wisely. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much for joining me today. And there's some great things on the horizon. I am excited about what God is doing, not just in my life personally, but in the lives of every believer. I am excited. I am excited. And I'm hoping that you are expecting, that you are, that you have an attitude of expectancy because God has some amazing things in store and you have to be ready. You have to be ready. Um, you not just getting ready, <laughs> not just getting ready, but have to be prepared. Um, and please remember this, that preparation time is not wasted time. It's not. Those of us who are actually in the profession of teaching, you know, we, we um, really appreciate prep time, right? Because it gives us an opportunity to prepare um, for our students. So preparation time is never wasted time. It may appear that nothing is going going on and God may be sitting back and no, 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 no. You know, right? Um, he's proven himself faithful. Even when we have been faithless, he has proven himself faithful time and time again. So from this Christian woman who is an educator, let me encourage you you know, dust off whatever those dreams were, you know, um, pull, pull up, you know, whatever things that you, you let lie dormant. God is not done. But understand this, everything that God is ever, is ever going to do, he's already done. It's already in you. He's already provided to you and for you everything that you need to get the job done. God, you're not waiting on God. God is waiting on you. He's already finished the work. I know I said, I want to leave you with this, but let me, let me just say something. Think about this. Before you were formed in your mother's womb, he knew you. And then Psalm 139, I believe, talks about he covers you in, his mother, in your mother's womb. You've been fearfully and wonderfully made. And then Jeremiah 29, 11, he knows the plans that he has for you. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you hope and a future. Think about those three things. Before he formed you in your mother's womb, he knew you. Then when you were formed in your mother's womb, he covered you and declares that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. And then 
he has a plan, a plan that's good. So knowing those three things, how can we sit back and say that we're waiting on God? Knowing though, just those three things alone, how can we sit back and say, well, I'm waiting for God to give me direction? I tell you what, start. Just start. Trust me, just start. So in the coming weeks, in the coming months, um, I'll share some things that God has 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 manifested because they've already done. So I'm doing what I need to do. It's exciting. It's an exciting time. Please do not allow pandemic to make you feel as if there's nothing that you can do, but sit back and wait. This is the time for us to move forward in the things of God. So once again, from this Christian woman who is an educator, to those of you who have a circle, a sphere of influence, and we all do, even if it's just one person that is following you, one person that you know you can be a mentor to, remember that you are to leave a legacy. You are to teach and to reach out to someone, um, giving them hope, giving them encouragement. Um, and if you feel that you need encouragement, the Bible says that we're to encourage ourselves in the Lord. I hope this has encouraged you, um, but don't sit back any longer. The world is waiting. You are the answer to someone's prayer. You are the solution to someone's problem. God bless you. Have a wonderful, wonderful weekend. And I'll see you again real soon. Please share this with someone that you think can benefit from it. Um, once again, don't forget, send me a message. If there's something in particular that you want to have discussed, and we'll discuss it. God bless you. Have a great weekend.